All righty. Welcome to Romero Records of Virtual Cast. Today we have on William. How's it going, man? Hey, it's going really great, Jackson. How about you, man? It's going great. Um, so yeah, I got you from Podmatch and um, basically just interested in what you what you got going on. So if you could just go ahead and get right into it and uh, tell us who you are, you know, what you what you do and, and how you got started. You know, I'm, I'm an executive coach, and that means that I come alongside entrepreneurs, founders, business leaders, and I help them to develop the leadership skills that they need. I became a student of leadership when I was 15 years old, Jackson. I was invited to attend my first leadership conference that year when a teacher saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And he said, hey, I think you'd really enjoy this. And he invited me to go. And I went and I sat and I heard about the power of leadership. What happens when it's done right? And I was hooked. And for, wow, going on four decades now, I've been a student of leadership, trying to learn, trying to grow. And for almost 30 years, I've been coaching leaders in a variety of different contexts, helping them to grow and learn so that they can achieve their capacity. I want to see them lead at a high performance level. And that's why I do what I do. What what's something that you feel like um kind of really struck you when the the teacher noticed something in you? What was something that you feel like it's like, oh yeah, that like that makes sense on why you why you saw that in me? Because I know it can be hard for people to like really notice things that other people notice in them. And then and then once you notice it, you gotta harness it, right? So if somebody says yeah. like, you're a great singer then now you have to notice you're a great singer. You're not just somebody who yeah. sings and then you have to do well at it. Like you have to like get better at it and like have that confidence. So like what, what was something that you noticed in yourself that you kind of like, yeah, I'm gonna go down this path and this is how I'm gonna do it. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the the first thing I would say to that is you, you self-awareness is a gift and it it comes over time through a lot of different ways. In this case, I had somebody on the outside who saw something in me and invited me to begin to express that and learn in it. But I had limiting beliefs already, even at that age, around leadership. I had limiting beliefs around what a leader was. We tend to think about leadership in a box, most people. And that box is we think of the person up front, the person with the microphone, the person who's who's exciting and exuberant and charismatic and bringing the passion and the energy. And that can be very true. But that's not the only way leadership manifests itself. That's not the only way a leader can lead. And that's not the only way a leader can look. And I had to get past that myself. If you look at me on the Myers-Briggs, I'm an ISTJ. And for the I, the introvert, man, I'm all the way on that side, right? So the idea of being the the you know life of the party, the, the one who's going to be right up in the middle of all of it, it's not me. It's not where I draw my energy. Now, I do a lot of things with people, and I speak to a lot of people and a lot of big crowds, and that means you have to be with people. And I love people. But I had to get beyond that limiting belief that because I don't look like this, I'm not a leader. That was tough. That was tough. And it took years for me to really grow beyond that. But that was one of the big pieces for me was getting past that limiting belief, understanding that leadership can can a leadership wiring can look a whole lot of different ways. Yeah, I think that has become an even bigger problem with uh, social media because mm, yeah. once once we had the ability to be on social media, everybody became an expert, right? So, I mean, That's you're right. <laughs> you're Doctor William, but there's so many people who are just online right now who mm -hmm. don't who aren't a doctor, you know, they don't have any kind of university credentials, mm -hmm. but they act like it, you know, they, mm -hmm. they portray it, they yeah. live the life, which that's, yeah. that is the positive and negative thing. The pro yeah. and con to social media is that you can be whoever you want online and it doesn't matter if it's true, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I always talk about, that's a yeah. great thing about America is that's the best and worst thing about America is mm -hmm. The the be, that's I say the best thing about America is you can do whatever you want. The worst yeah. thing about America is you can do whatever you want. And <laughs> that's that's true. And it's something that is hurting um it's hurting the average person's perception of information 
of digesting information. And Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we have people who have been to university or they have been to some kind of uh, structured uh, learning and, and even people, you know, even if it's not structured, people who've done research Mm -hmm. that are spreading information properly, because sometimes people just, um, they digest the wrong stuff and then they get misinformed and then they think, oh, you know, because you're, you know, so-and-so like this has to be right. But it's like, no, some people just, some people just act like, you know, they're the expert on something when they really aren't. So it's, it can be difficult, but yeah, just, I was just thinking about that when you were (laughs) discussing what you said. You know, I think, I think that's such a good point. I'm I'm outside DC, right. And you go downtown, you see the treasury department, right. And, and this is where the, the secret service, like this is where they're out of this, out of that department. And one of the functions of the Secret Service that is, it's not protection. One of their functions is is counterfeiting, right? Is uncovering counterfeiters. And you know how they train these agents to learn how to spot counterfeit currency? They don't show them counterfeit currency. They show them the real thing. Mm. They study the real thing. And they expose them so much to the real thing that they can spot something that's not from a mile away. Mm. And this is what I think that we have the opportunity to do. We can come into this social media sphere and we can bring the real thing. We can bring the research, we can bring the data, we can bring the insights and the wisdom that comes, you know, from decades of what we do. We can bring that and people will recognize it, right? Over time, they're going to recognize the real thing that there's so much misinformation, so much, so much out there that's not ringing true. It's not helpful. And I think one of my goals is is to is to bring information, bring data, bring stories that are helpful, that help people understand, hey, you know what? I know where you are and I know where you want to be. And there's a way to build a bridge. We can get you there. Yeah. Funny story about like the the ability to know the difference between stuff. And that's to me, that's food. Like I'm a big foodie. Like I love yeah. to try different kinds of food and and different areas and stuff like that. And I remember, like, I don't even remember how old I was, but I, my parents used to always buy Sunny D. Like they, huh, yeah. that, that was the drink of of breakfast juice is Sunny D. And then I just remember the one time that I had like real orange juice, like mm. a can of or something like that, and you know, not from concentrate. And I was like. Oh my God. Like this is, <laughs> this is great. Like, Where's this been? <laughs> exactly. Like this is amazing. And so that that concept of getting the real thing and understanding what that is, because Sunny D is orange drink, right? Like it's not right. even it's not even what it is. And like I always thought like Sunny D, like vitamin D, but it's like yeah. Vitamin C is what Sunny D has. <laughs> That's right. It's not, even, it's not even that. So, yeah, it's it's just funny when you are able to really discern like authenticity, in which authenticity is like in value. Like you can't yeah. put a dollar figure on yeah. somebody or something that actually holds its value in how authentic it is. And if like you're a person. So yeah. If you're a person who's like talking to people and and giving them encouragement and stuff like that, if you seem authentic, people are going to be more inclined to listen to you and trust you. Mm-hmm. And if you're yeah. not, then people are going to be like, eh, I don't know. Like if you're trying to sell some kind of uh, plan or, or service or whatever, if people think that you're being authentic with them, then they're 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 probably willing to try it. But if people feel like you're you're basically scamming them or scheming yeah. them into your service or plan. They're going to be more you know shy, more back offish with how they uh, perceive your information. So yeah, that that authentic taste of of who you are and what you're doing that's that's in, invaluable. I love what you're saying there about how people sense that, and I think that's so true. I, I love how Jeff Henderson writes about this. He's got a book called Know What You're For. And the framing that he talks about in the book is one I use with clients often. There's two different ways of approaching a conversation or a relationship or a, a conflict, right? You can focus on what you want from the other person, which is what most of us do, 
right? If you come into a situation where you're having a conversation, what do I want from them? What, what am I after from this? What, what am I going to get from this? That's how most people we interact with approach those, those relationships, those conversations. But what if you spun it? And Jeff says, what if we talked about this as though I'm looking at this and saying, hey, what do I want for you? All of a sudden, that changes the entire tenor. And here's the funny thing about it. When I approach a conversation about what I want for you, when I approach a situation, even like our conversation today, about what I want for Jackson, what does that mean? Well, it means that you're going to know that. You're going to sense that. You're going to smell that because we all do. And when we smell authenticity, we smell the real thing, we lean in. Just like when you got a taste of real orange juice, you leaned in. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, yeah. Oh, man, I want more of that. That's what happens when we're that authentic version of ourselves and we're thinking about, hey, how can I bring value to this person? What do I want for them? This is, I believe, one of the highest callings of real leadership. Yeah, it's it's important that we have some sort of uh, e- even just like examples of people mm-hmm. in our lives that are that are creating that type of that type of atmosphere, that type of um, just knowledge and wisdom that that keeps us in that in that mode of yeah. like, oh, yeah, this is this is how you do it. This is this yeah. is what you're supposed to do. And, and even going back to like my social media example, like there are people who are are pointing out those those people who aren't doing the right thing or aren't saying the right things. And yeah. uh, I, I think we should celebrate those people because they're saying like, hey, you know, this is this is the truth and this is the data that backs up this research. This is the data that backs up, you know, what's going on so that we can continue to to progress and move forward in our everyday lives of pursuing what's real and and what and what we can do to mm. be better humans i, I think mm. that it's the good. more the more information that we share uh yeah. with each other it it allows us to to become better and if we aren't if we aren't doing those things like people who are having seminars and conferences and and sharing information, the more that we do those things, it allows us to just become that 1% better every time we, we get into those environments. So yeah, it's, I, th- I think those are, those are great things. And that's a choice. It's a choice every person can make and it costs you nothing. Yeah. I mean, really, what, this is an investment into somebody else. This is an investment into the future. It's an investment into success and it costs you nothing. Why would we not do this? To me, that's a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. Now, what are some things that you have learned over time about, I guess, just people and how they react to uh, things that you, uh, services you provide, things that you say, stuff like that? Because sometimes it can be hard for people to, I guess, grasp concepts mm-hmm. that they either just know a little bit about or they know nothing about um how do you uh kind of deal with how people react to Hmm. the things that you discuss with them that's a great question Uh, part of it has to do with listening you know i'm constantly my radar is constantly on and i'm constantly listening not just for what people say but for the other types of communication, I mean, 90% of communication is nonverbal. And so I want to constantly be, be listening and attuned to that so that I can respond appropriately. Uh, if it also allows me to adjust how I'm communicating. The three areas that I typically will work with with clients is leadership, mindset, and productivity. And those three go hand in hand in a whole lot of ways. Mindset is, is a very large piece of success or failure. You know, you determine, you predecide, you predetermine what you're going to do. You predecide, you predetermine where you're going to go. And when people do that in a healthy and sustainable way, it makes a difference. I, I, I'm thinking about a client that uh, really struggled, right? I mean, just struggled to get beyond the bootstrap phase with a business, just really could not get there. Finally broke through, finally got got beyond that, then built a business into a seven-figure business right? Finding good success. Now staring down eight figures. 
but in an unhealthy and unsustainable way. Mm. And so we began to work together and, and I'm, I'm listening to the stories about how they came out of corporate and, and, oh, it's just awful. It's terrible. And this was expected. And this was, this was what the environment was like. And this is what the relationships with coworkers were like. And this was the hours and this was the expectations and just explaining all this stuff. And as I listened to him complaining about all these things that had been, and I listened to him describing what was, I finally had to stop and say, well, hang on just a second. It sounds a whole lot to me like you have recreated your corporate job in your business. Mm. And it just, it just, it's like, it's like I hit him with a stick. <laughs> Wait, really? Like, well, yeah, I guess, I guess I have. He couldn't see it. You can't see the whole picture when you're in the frame. You can't. You need somebody on the outside who's going to ask you questions that maybe nobody else is asking you to help you see what you're just not going to see on your own. In this case, he was receptive to that. You know, sometimes I ask a question and the response is completely dismissive. And typically those are not long-term clients. The one non-negotiable I have for people that I'm going to work with is the one non-negotiable of what I call catalytic leadership. And that is the cultivation of a teachable spirit. That means I don't know everything. That means I've got to walk into every conversation pre-deciding that I want to be the most teachable person in the room because I believe you can learn from anybody. Sometimes you learn what not to do. That's okay. That can be incredibly helpful. But I want to approach conversations with that mindset. And this is what I expect of my clients. Not that I have all the answers, but together, we're going to help you get where you want to go. Together, we're going to build that bridge from where you are to that place. But the only way that's going to happen is if you understand that nobody knows everything and nobody is good at everything, right? This is so often the, in entrepreneurship, this is so often we start and all of us start our businesses alone, right? We have to do everything. We got to do it all. And I get that. But as you grow and as you find success, you begin to scale, you hire other people to help you. But the problem with most is they become the lid on the organization. They won't let go, right? They just won't let go. And so they hire somebody, but then they're constantly looking over their shoulder or they're telling them, well, I, I don't think I'd do it that way. Hang on just a second. I think you, you need to do it this way. Well, they're not going to stick around <laughs> and your business is not going to grow. And I can predict that with 100% confidence. Yeah, there's um, there's so many people who eventually they they kind of get that whole taste of your own medicine type thing, and once they once they have that realization, is like what you were saying. It's it's like that's when it truly hits them. And sometimes mm -hmm. you know you need a negative experience to mm -hmm. uh, start becoming positive, and. I was thinking about Lord of the Flies when you were talking about that oh. situation. Cause yeah. like those kids couldn't wait to be by themselves. And then when they were by themselves, they ended up just doing the same thing that they were already into, yes. which was government, you know, uh, yep. being told what to do. Like they started de developing rules and it was like, we were trying to escape all that. And we just <laughs> ended up doing that ourselves. Well, imagine, imagine a group of people who broke away from, I don't know, a different country and said they wanted to form a different type of government. And imagine if they were so frustrated with overburdening taxation, if they were so frustrated with, with legislation and overburdening, overburdensome regulations, and they started a country and then they recreated all of that to the nth degree. I know that's hard to believe, but imagine if that were to happen, what that would feel like. Yeah. It's the human experience. It's what we do. We replicate what we know. I mean, you could you could make an argument. That's what the U.S. has done. Like, when we, <laughs> 100%. <laughs> yeah, when the pilgrims and everybody broke away from from Europe and, and its rule, um, or England and, and its rule, they, they came here to have all the freedoms that they want. Like, they literally could have did anything, right? Like, mm -hmm. they ended up pushing Native Americans back and, and started doing what they wanted to do and then built their own government and then govern themselves. And then it is what it is today of com it probably completely different than what, you know, founding fathers, what, what they had oh. in mind. 
hundred percent. But even a percent famous phrase of George Washington is what we say is that he was like, "Do not form parties. Whatever you do, do not form parties. We form parties." <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. One of their biggest complaints was taxation without representation. Right? Overburden some taxation. You're taxing everything. So what do we do now? Tax. We tax everything. <laughs> <laughs> We're taxing your property. We're taxing your car. We're taxing your groceries. We're taxing your house. We can keep going. <laughs> and and then imagine if we had like some sort of outside source, like what you were talking yeah. about, to audit us. And like yes. imagine, imagine if like the UN was like, all right, US, let's 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 look at what you've been doing over the past two hundred and something years. Um yeah, you basically been doing what you were trying to get away from. <laughs> right, right, right. And this is the challenge for most people. You know, I've had coaches for years because I can't see what I can't see either. No one can. You can't read the label from inside the bottle. And that's where we are. We need people on the outside who, who are going to give us a different perspective and help us to grow in self-awareness. That's where change lives. Yeah. And, and if you can have that kind of, um, as, as we're saying, like audit, like that kind yeah. of awareness of what's going on in your everyday habits, all that kind of stuff, then you truly can make change from there. But until you have some kind of evaluation, uh, then and it's difficult. It's difficult to be able to understand like what you're doing and, and how you're, how you're making changes, how you're making moves, and it can be difficult to progress, all that kind of stuff. So it's very valuable to have somebody like a coach um, in your life because otherwise you're you're just like, um, you know, just think of like a team, like a, a football team, basketball team, whatever, mm -hmm. just out there just, you know, drawing stuff up in the dirt. Like just picture a professional team. And like a lot of people are probably like, why does LeBron and his team need a coach? It's like mm – -hmm. <laughs> I guarantee you, if you watched a basketball team yeah. play without a coach, you would understand why they need a coach because mm -hmm. everybody starts thinking they know what's best because Absolutely. they're in the game. They're, they're doing is like, Oh, I see everything. You know, I'm in the game, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, you need that outside source to see what's actually going on so that they can help the, the whole team. You know, they can see the whole yeah. picture. Yeah, and it's not just one coach, is it? We look at the head coach, and we're like, "Oh, the head coach." Yeah, but they've got they've got like coaches for so many different parts of their life, down to mindset coaches, down to nutrition coaches. Like this is this is this is a holistic endeavor because they understand any one of these pieces can derail the athlete. You want to get to high performance, you got to take it all into account. You can't just focus on one thing. Yeah, I, I think that when when you do have somebody in your life that can help you do that, it basically what, to me, what it does is it helps you get to where you're going faster. And yes. so my company damage media group, um, we have our like motto or our phrase is accelerating your success. So it's nice. like, yeah, you whatever you're doing is working for you, right? Like you're a company or business, um, you know, you're, you're profitable or, or not, you know, you're just making a revenue, but what we want to do is accelerate your success. So yes. we're, we're taking whatever you're doing. We're not trying to change you. We're not trying to make you something different. We just want to create some content, create some different, um, ways of thinking to help mm -hmm. you get to where you want to go faster. And that's yes. what an outside source can do for you. That's what a coaching can do for you. It can help um, get you to where you want to go faster because how you're doing it is, is cruise control. Cause that's, that's, mm. op, that's optimally what everybody wants to do. Everybody yeah. wants their business to be in cruise control. Cause that means, you know, my hands can be off the wheel. I can, I can pay attention to other things. I don't have to be constantly gas and brake. I can just cruise and just make money. Like that's all I need to do. But somebody needs to come in to be like, Hey, you know, what you're doing is great, but wouldn't it be a little better if you did this thing? Wouldn't it be a little better if you did that thing? So yeah, that's, yes. that's the value of that outside source and, and coaching and stuff in my opinion. 
hundred percent. And I think that evaluation is, I'm guessing one of the expertises you bring when you work with a client, you bring that ability to look at, walk in and say, Hey, I don't know if you've seen this, but this needs some work. I don't know if you've seen this, but man, if you just did this one thing here, this could skyrocket. What what are some things that you have noticed that a lot of people, as far as like, um, like misconceptions, uh, they might have about their own business. So things that people might overlook most of the time mm -hmm. in their own business. I think one is that once you figure out what works, that it's always going to work. Mm. Excuse me. This idea that, that man, once I dial it in, once I dial it in, then, then I can kick back. Maybe that is true in some field. I have yet to encounter it in almost 30 years of coaching leaders. The fact is that we never, ever coast to excellence. We coast to mediocrity. Mm. And mediocrity inspired no one ever. And so if, if, if my goal is excellence in what I'm doing, then I've got to understand that evaluation is part of the process. And it's not something that I just do at the beginning. It's a perpetual practice. I, I, I teach my clients to, to do a weekly review, right? And this is, this is true of their own leadership, their own sphere of influence, but also thinking beyond into their business. But I want you to think about this and I want you to look back over the last week and I want you to ask yourself three questions. And they're simple questions, but most people don't ask them. The first one, what went right this week that I can celebrate? What went right? This is the one game changer most people never do. Hmm. We want to immediately run to what went wrong. <laughs> most of us can find a hundred things that went wrong this week. That's not hard. I want you to start with what went right. Because if you will focus there, what you focus on is what you get more of. I don't know about you, Jackson. I want more wins in my life. I hmm. want more wins in my business. I'm going to focus on the wins. What's going right? I'm going to celebrate those wins. And I'm going to capture them. I'm actually going to write them down in what I call a wins journal. This provides first that iteration, that neurological iteration that's, going, oh, yeah, yeah, this reinforcement. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. It's going to stick more. I'm going to remember it more. But second, over time, that wins journal becomes a knowledge base. And on those days when I struggle, just like every entrepreneur does, on those days when you wonder, man, is this even worth it? Is this even going to work? Am I going to get where I want to go? I stop and I say, okay, you know what? That's a feeling and it's valid. But is it true? Mm. Is, that what the, is that what the data says? And I pull out the wind journal. And here I've got a knowledge base of data now. And I'm going to start walking through those data points. I'm going to start walking through that wind journal. And I'm like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Oh yeah. Because we forget our wins. We fixate on our losses. We fixate on the things that went wrong. We forget our wins. I walk back through some of those and all of a sudden my mindset shifts. And I remember, yeah, this is working. I can do this. Yeah, I am help. I am making a difference. Yeah, yeah. That one simple practice can be a game changer. Keeping a win journal. Asking yourself every week, what went right this week that I can celebrate? That's the first question. Second question, what went wrong? We got to do that, right? What didn't go the way I expected? Capture those things. And then the third question, in a similar situation in the future, how would I deal with that differently? This is where you process through the learning so that the next time you're in a similar situation, you will have already processed through what you want to do differently. You don't have to decide in that moment. It's not dependent on everything working right and you having time to think it through. No, I've already done that. What went right this week? What went wrong? And how would I do that differently next time? If you will ask those three questions every week, you will find yourself on a growth trajectory personally and professionally. You will find your business on a growth trajectory over time. So I, I, I completely agree with the whole, um, you know, people like to focus on the negatives first, but how, how do you get people to kind of, I mean, obviously, I mean, you said, you know, first one is think about the positive. So how, how do you get people to, I guess, go more, go deeper into their positive thinking instead of their negative thinking? Like you can say like, all right, 
always step one, think positive, but how do you get people to do a better job at, at focusing on those positive things so that when they make, when they go through your step one, step two, or question one, question two, question three, how do they get more positive thoughts in there instead of um, thinking about all the negative things that went wrong? Well, we measure what matters. And so what I do when I'm in a session is we go over your wins. I want to hear them. I want to know what they were. Oh, well, I didn't really get to that. Okay, no problem. We'll do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> because I want to help you retrain your brain. And the only way that's going to happen is through repetition mm. and consistency over time. Consistency, a friend of mine says, consistency is the mother of momentum. Mm. Okay. I want to help you get momentum. That's what every leader wants. We all want the big mo. Great. Well, consistency is how you get there. I want you to change your wiring. I want you to change how you're looking at the world, what you're looking for. The only way I know to do that is consistency. So I'm going to, in the middle of this, I, well, hey, didn't do it. That's okay. Let's do it right now. What were your wins in the last seven days? Let's write them down because I'm going to train you to do that. Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest issues that a lot of people have is kind of like what you're what you're talking about right here is like, um, so my, my big thing is is going to the gym. So mm -hmm. a lot of people like I'm a, I'm a pretty fit person, but like um, a lot of people think because I work out often, it must be easy for me, and and it's not. Like yeah. I I still have to because I like being busy. I like doing podcasts and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a content creation company. I haven't created any content today. And, and then I also have a full-time job. And so when I get done with this podcast, I got to go to my full-time job. Mm -hmm. So I don't have time sometimes to go to the gym unless I prioritize it. And so, Bingo. yeah. Bingo. So I, today, um, I've been making a thing like I go to the gym at nine o'clock and if I don't go, like by like nine ten or so, then I'm probably just not going to go, and I'm going to do something else that's mm -hmm. uh, that's productive. Mm -hmm. And so today, that that was my decision. I, I, at nine, I just went, and so that's something that I think a lot of people need is like what you were yeah. talking about. Like, oh, you know, I didn't go to the gym today. Okay, well, if we got an hour, let's go right now. Let's, that's right, let's go right now. And so yeah. that's I think sometimes people need that. They they think. Yes. They think it's too late and it's mm -hmm. like, no, do it right now. Like, yeah, you, you were probably going to waste an hour at some point in your day. Just do that thing that you've been putting off right now. I love that Jackson. And I think that keys in on something that is so important. We make this perfect idealized view of what it must look like to be successful. If I'm going to have a successful day, that means I'm going to be in the gym at six o'clock in the morning. That means I'm going to be having breakfast at 7.30. That means I'm going to be reading at 7.45, something that's that's going to feed me and teach me and help me to grow. And that means by 8.30, I'm focused on work. I'm at my desk. And if it doesn't look exactly like that, if I wake up late, if it's 6.15 before I wake up, oh, well, the whole thing's ruined. Failure. I might as well not do any of it. Oh, well. <laughs> no, you start where you are not where you think you should be. You start where you are. You do what you can. Don't let what you can't do stop you from doing what you can. Yeah, there's um there's like this famous like a uh, quote that I've seen on social media. It's like if you had $10,000 in your bank account or something like that and somebody comes yeah. and steals a dollar, do you just give them the rest of the money? Like no. <laughs> so <laughs> So why are you letting one thing affect your whole day? Like yes. if, if one thing happens to you, that's just that one thing. Yes. Go, go continue to be productive. Go continue to do what you need to do because yes. don't, don't let, you know, Oh, I didn't read my book at 6 AM. My whole day is ruined. Like <laughs> you have the rest of the day to read a book, like <laughs> read one page, read, read right. one paragraph, you know? Right. Move the goalpost, declare the win. <laughs> you can do it. So many times, I believe we all need a reset button on our desk. We need a reset button on our dashboard. We need a reset button wherever we are so that when something happens and it just jars us and kind of knocks us off and we're like, ah, oh, 
No, 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 no. Reset. Reset. No, I got three new lives. The game just started over. Reset. I'm fresh. Let's go. It helps us to refocus. Yeah, I think that's a bit of the whole like um like perfection type thing yeah. what i was talking about with like social media like so many people yeah. are portraying so many positive wins online yeah. and i actually just posted about this the other day i was talking about how i want um so i i have like four you well now i have five youtubes but i have I, I had four and that was one was um this podcast and then one was like my music. And then I had two for Damage Media Group. That was one like creating content for uh, companies. And then another one was creating content for like the artists that I managed. So those are the nice. four things I had. So I decided to make a fifth one. And this one is more about like my everyday. And mm. why is because, I and I named it just Jackson Henderson. Because I was like, I think people need a view of just like all the things that i do mm -hmm. and like all my mess ups and because yes i i get so hungry for like knowledge and stuff like that and i watch a ton of youtubes on people <laughs> who are like i started my etsy and i sell stuff on etsy now and i make five thousand dollars a day it's like okay cool but what happened on day one what happened on yeah. day 10 what happened yes. on day 20 Right. And, and that's what I think is a lacking from a lot of content. And people are probably like, well, that's not sexy. You know, that's, that's boring, you know, knowing what somebody did, but honestly, that's, that's, what's going to help somebody that's right. do, do what you're doing more than anything is if they see your process, because if they, yes. and, and it has discouraged me, like in, in my journey to try to make money online, like when I see these people like doing so well and that's, they show like just a small portion of what they did. I'm just like, Oh, I just suck at this. Like I don't, I have no idea what's going on. But <laughs> yeah. If somebody had showed more of their progress and, or yeah. process of how they got to where they are, I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Like that's why yeah. they struggled so long. And, and that's how they got to where they are now is because yeah. they didn't know what they were doing either. So that's, that's my new YouTube is going to be more about like, it's basically more of like my failures and like my process of how, of how I like do all the things that I do, because I want people mm. to see like how long it takes mm. to do stuff, yes. how long yes. it takes to be successful. Cause a lot of people have a, a misconception of how people got to where they're going. Like th think about anybody who's famous on, on uh, mm -hmm. YouTube or Instagram or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's use Instagram for, I actually remember when Instagram came around, it came around mm -hmm. in like 2012, I think 2013, mm -hmm. yeah. something like that. Yeah. So that means anybody, anybody who is successful on Instagram hasn't been doing it for more than 12 years. That's right. the longest they could possibly have been doing it. And yeah. I guarantee you, most of them have been, probably less than less than five years mm. but it still took them that long <laughs> at, at least on, on instagram but they were probably doing it yes. before then and you haven't seen it because it yeah. didn't exist you you weren't able to see it and so that, right. i think that's important for people to to know about stuff is like how long it takes for people to do stuff the process and all the failures that they had that made them who they are today. Mm. I love the idea of your new channel. I want to check this out. <laughs> I think one of the pitfalls of social media is that we are looking at other people's highlight reels and we're comparing our day to day yeah. to their highlight reel. And we're like, Oh, like you said, I'm a failure. I'm a loser. Why can't I do that? No, no, you're, you're, you're trying to compare two, two very different things, right? I've worked with enough high capacity, high performing leaders to tell you that the, the overnight successes that I have worked with took decades to get there. Yeah. There is no overnight. No, it's decades because there's no such thing as a wasted experience in your life. There's no such thing. Everything makes you into the you, you are now. Everything you've been through, good, bad, and different. 
understanding that their success was not made up just of three right choices or of four right days. Sorry. No, it was made up of the decades that led up to that. Like you're saying, these Instagram success stories, these are years in the making. Don't think after two months, ah, oh, never going to get there. Nah, nah. Consistency is the mother of momentum. Yeah. And, and when people understand that, when they understand that like daily grind of like, oh, I have, I need to get up and just do this thing. And even what we were just talking about, like, okay, you missed your, your, uh, 6 a.m. reading. Like, okay, uh, you got tomorrow. Like, <laughs> right, right. There's another day. The <laughs> book is still going to be there. The book didn't give up on you. So that's right. Or just, before bed tonight, instead of scrolling, Maybe read a couple pages that night. Hey, guess what? You got it in. The day's not over. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's those, it's the really the small things of people just evaluating their, their everyday habits. Like those habits, like you said, the consistency is another momentum. Like you also need to just understand how those habits are creating who you are. Like yeah. your, uh, everything that you do is going to develop you into to who you are. If you if you change like just multiple habits in your life, you're going to be a different person. Like people are yes. going to say, "Oh man, like you've changed, like you you know, you're different." And it's because that you are literally a different person. I, I use the mm -hmm. analogy with um with just like if if somebody lost uh like 10 pounds, mm -hmm. you would say that that person it's like um you, you would say that that person like looks better. It's like, oh man, you look great. You know, mm -hmm. but if somebody were to lose a hundred pounds, right. you'd say, oh man, like you, I didn't recognize you. You look different. And it's because that is not the same person. They completely right. change their habits. They can change everything about them. They can say that they've changed everything about themselves and they're now a different person. That's why people say, I don't, I didn't recognize you. You could see the same thing if somebody cleans up their their inner self. They're more positive about mm -hmm. themselves. It's like, oh, man, I, I didn't recognize you. And it's because now you might just like being a positive person, like mm -hmm. eyebrows raised, smiles, big, big eyes. Like yes. you, you might appear as a different person instead of like being like all sad and gloomy. Right. And it's just your everyday habits. Yeah, that's it. And, and it's not, you know, that, that person who lost a hundred pounds didn't do it in a week. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't do it in two weeks. Right. It wasn't three weeks of good habits that got them there. Yeah. It took time. Allow yourself the time. Give yourself that grace. Understand that this is going to be a journey. Right. And success is never, ever, ever, ever produced in a microwave. Success is a slow cooker, man. The best meals that I ever eat do not come out of a microwave. Mm. They come out of the slow cooker. Yeah, it's, it's, I think, a difficult thing for a lot of people to understand because of this instantaneous lifestyle that humans have created. And it's definitely something that I think a lot of people need to bring attention to. Um, people as like you, as coaches, like you don't probably have, you know, I'm guessing you don't have any like one week plans, you know, <laughs> you know no, no. <laughs> give me your three day plan, man. Like, I'm just trying to get this over with. And yeah. I actually did that with, uh, one of the artists I work with. Um, yeah, they, they asked me something and I was like, um, oh, they, they were trying to, they were talking about like releasing music. And, um, I was like, well, I mean, if that's what you want to do, if you want to hurry up and get this music done with it, that's how you want to treat your career as well. And they're mm -hmm. like, oh, <laughs> and, and it clicked in their head that I was like, what are you trying to rush this out for? Are you trying to rush your career? Is that yeah. what you want? You want a 10 minute career? Like, let's, yeah. let's take our time, figure this out and, and do the right yes. thing because you can't get things done quickly if that's if you want longevity success. And so that's why I say like, you know, nobody's coming to you asking for your one week plan or your three day plan is because that's, that's all they're going to get. 
and how much progress can you really make in that period of time? And if you can make that much progress in that period of time, you didn't need a coach in the first place. You just needed a that's right a, something something different than than that. But yeah, there's a reason why programs and stuff take a little longer is because they're trying to set you up to create those habits. Isn't there like a a book or something that's uh, that says like you know, it takes like ninety days or something like that to to break habits or something. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah. it's important. It it takes a while. It does, it does. And and understanding that, you know, like you said, this this idea. I want to get this done quick. I want to get it done quick. Well, then you're going to get quick results. Mm-hmm. Is 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 the gourmet meal you're dreaming of? Is it a hot pocket? <laughs> is that really it? That that's your dream? Because that's what you're aiming at with that kind of a mindset. You know, one of my heroes and somebody I've learned so much from over the years uh, is a guy named John Maxwell. John has written over a hundred books on leadership. Phenomenal accomplishment. He's still going. His newest one comes out in a couple months. Mm. Brilliant thinker, brilliant writer. John has just become a prolific writer and voice in the leadership space. But how long has it taken him to write over a hundred books? Oh, yeah, well. He didn't do it in a year, (laughs) right? He started writing in the early 70s. Mm. This is a 50-year run for him as a writer, as a thinker, as a contributor to the space. That's the mindset we need to be thinking. We need to be thinking about a long run. We need to quit thinking small. We need to quit thinking, hey, what, what can get me the fastest return? No, no, no. You need to think long not small. Something that I'm actually curious about is the age groups of people that you work with. Uh, mm-hmm. what, what are the difference in ages that you, that you've seen people looking for leadership advice? Hmm. You know, the youngest clients I have are, are business owners that are in their early twenties. Uh, the oldest clients I, I have currently would be in their sixties. Uh, though I have worked with clients in their seventies. Hmm. Uh, and the the one thing that they all have in common is they all understand that they're not done, that they still want to grow and learn, and that growth only happens on the other side of change, that it takes intentionality. And they understand that they need an outside perspective. And so I become, you know, in some cases, a thinking partner to help them think through the challenges that their business is facing. In some cases, I become a, a trusted advisor, you know, a non-equity strategic partner who's going to help them to, to think through the challenges in, in the industry or whatever it is that they're facing. Um, you know, I, I operate in different ways for different clients. Uh, some need a pure coach, somebody who's just going to help them draw out of them what's already in there. Uh, and, and I can work with them to do that. But, but in each case, the thing that runs, no matter the age, is going to be that teachable spirit. And we all know the phrase, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but do you, do you feel like the older people, um, are, are they having more wisdom and, and they're, they're more coachable, more teachable, or mm-hmm. is it kind of a, still a mixture? Cause sometimes people who have been there, done that, they, they might, they might still come to you for coaching, but they're like, well, I already know that I already tried mm-hmm. that stuff, stuff like that. Yeah. And typically people like that are not going to come to me. <laughs> and if they do, uh, I don't, I, I'm not going to work with them. And that sounds harsh, but a teachable spirits are non-negotiable for me. And this is why I'll turn down more clients than I accept, mm. because if they don't have that, I can't help them. And I'm not going to waste their time, my time or their money. You need to come into this understanding that, Hey, together, we're going to explore a lot of different things. And some of those things may have been things that you've tried in some way, but we may talk about trying it in a different way. Just because you tried something once and it didn't work doesn't mean you should never try it again. It just means you may need to try it at a different time, in a different way, or with a different person. Are are there certain types of people that you have noticed do better with you than than others? Like, you know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm assuming that you uh, are paying attention to these uh, very intuitive type testing, like you mentioned, Myers Briggs. Mm-hmm. Uh, are are there certain kinds of people that you have noticed are are performing better or progressing better than others? No, 
And, and I run all of my clients through a number of different assessments at the beginning of the engagement because I want to understand their wiring so that I can communicate with them and guide them based on their wiring, not on some cookie cutter, one size fits all approach. I want to operate according to how they are wired. And so I run them through a multiple assessments and uh, there's not one type that comes out of that. It's all across the board. The, the one thing, and again, not to beat this horse again, but the one thing that they all have in common is they have a teachable spirit. And to circle back to what you asked a second ago, sometimes the older clients can be more teachable because they've experienced more failure. Failure can be a fantastic teacher if you see it as such. Yeah, and, and that's why I like I like working with people who, who like trying stuff because yes. that tells me that they one have an open mind and then two yes. are willing to fail like yes. if if you don't like trying things and you probably don't like failing and you're yes. you're scared to to make mistakes yeah I, i'm like i hate making mistakes like i absolutely hate it I, i'm i'm not a perfectionist and i think that's um people who say that they're a perfectionist some, somebody on one of my podcasts says something great and i was trying to mm -hmm. re-say it and i forgot what it was mm -hmm. but they said something about like if you think you're a perfectionist then that's dang i forgot what it was it was phenomenal whatever they said <laughs> but um yeah i i think that if you um if you hate making mistakes it's yeah. it's a great thing but you shouldn't be just trying to be a perfectionist in like not making mistakes because right. then you aren't, you aren't learning anything. Like you aren't That's really right. trying enough stuff. And so I think you have to be willing to, to mess up. Like you have to be willing to, to make those, um, make those mistakes and, and have those issues because then you'll, you'll learn and you'll learn faster. A lot of people say the goal is to fail faster. Like fail yes. as, as possible because yes. you're running out of time. Oh, I had, I did do a podcast with a guy and he, um, we were talking about the difference between young people and older people's decision-making. Mm. And he was like, um, I, I don't, I don't take as many risks as I used to because mm. I know that I'm like running out of time. And so I, mm. I don't have time to make that many mistakes. And I was like, oh, that's, mm. that's pretty interesting. Because like young people, mm. you've got yeah. time to mess up. <laughs> yeah. You've got Absolutely. time to make mistakes. I think, I think we should continue throwing spaghetti at the wall no matter how old we are, though. I got to tell you, I throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. And a lot of it doesn't. But the only way I'm going to figure out what does is to keep trying. I think one of the best questions we can ask each other, our kids, one of the best questions we can ask is, hey, what did you fail at today? Mm. What did you fail at? Because that normalizes failure. It says it's okay. And it celebrates because that's one step closer to success. One of my favorite quotes is from Thomas Edison when he was asked by a reporter, what did it feel like to, to fail 10,000 times trying to create a light bulb? And Edison bristled and he said, I did not fail 10,000 times. I discovered 10,000 ways that wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. That's the mindset I want. That's the mindset I want for my clients. That's the mindset I want for every person I work with and speak to. I want you to understand that failure is part of getting to success. It is the ticket of admission. And if you want to minimize your failures, you are also going to minimize your success. That's that's completely true. And, and I think as a society, we should definitely... Um, celebrate <laughs> our failures celebrate yes. the things that we have messed up at because we have either learned from it or we have as edison has said found a way not to do it yeah, yeah that's valuable <laughs> yeah absolutely um well let's it's about time to to wrap up um if you could i guess just give everybody ways that they could contact you uh find all your info online um anything you got Sure. The best way to connect with me is on LinkedIn. Uh, just look for William C. Attaway. I'm the only one of those. Uh, love to, to share with you. I do uh, LinkedIn live events once a month where I share some things that I'm currently learning, working with clients, things that may be helpful for you in your journey. Um, my most recent book came out in 2022, Catalytic Leadership. And I'd love to offer your listeners a, a free copy of the book. 
If they want to go to catalyticleadershipbook.com, uh, if they're willing to pay the shipping, it's four ninety five for the continental U.S. We'll be glad to get a copy of that out to them. And if they're international, we'll do a digital copy for them. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all the knowledge and wisdom that you shared on the podcast. It's great hearing people uh, truly be able to relay like all the services that they have that are in coaching and leadership, because those are the kind of things that, as we said, it, it helps you just, you know, do a little bit more, get, get a, a little bit better from that yes. outside source, from that outside audit, because sometimes we we don't see the true picture when, as you said, when you're inside the bottle, it's hard to see the label. So we, we need somebody on that outside letting us know what's going on. So thank you so much. Jackson, thanks for having me, man. It's been a great conversation. Awesome. Well, thank you for everybody for tuning in and we'll see you next time.